So uh, we have Sheila Donia uh, Kukan, and she is the Chief Engagement Officer of Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity, otherwise known as CARE. She's gonna talk about building virtual and inclusive volunteer programs. Sheila is the Chief Engagement Officer for CARE. Sheila has been part of the animal welfare industry since 2003, when she was a 15-year-old volunteer at her local shelter. She started her professional career in 2009 while finishing her undergraduate degree in political science from the University of California, uh, LA, at UCLA, working on compassionate legislation for the city of Los Angeles. She was instrumental in laws and policies that ban the commercial sale of puppy mill dogs, cat declawing, and the use of bull, ho bull hooks on elephants in traveling shows. Since then, she has continued to devote her time to finding opportunities to bring people and pets together, working with national organizations such as Best Friends Animal Society, Austin Pets Alive, and Pet Health Inc. Through her current role with CARE, Sheila is focused on how to save more lives through a focus on inclusivity and human and animal well-being. She's committed to using her diverse background to bring vitality to the lives to lives furry and otherwise while promoting life-saving through inclusivity. Sheila lives in San Diego, California with her husky mix Ziba and enjoys fostering from her local shelter partners. Sheila, I'd like to welcome you and look forward to the presentation. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for that intro. I love hearing my dog's name and I just decided it's a goal of mine to have her as a trivia answer one day. So new goals, thank you. <laughs> And hi everyone, um, I am Sheila, as Stacey mentioned, I am the Chief Engagement Officer for CARE. So I wanted to share some of the CARE lens that we're looking at programs through. We're really, um, for those of you who don't know, it's Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity. So we're looking at increased life-saving opportunities through reducing implicit bias in animal welfare in general. And we really believe that inclusivity equals life-saving. So I'm going to use that lens to talk a little bit about volunteer programs this morning, or I guess it's afternoon. Um, and um, we can go ahead and start. So we'll talk about virtual components in general, which is really something that got highlighted for us, obviously, during the pandemic. And then also just um, looking through an inclusive lens and opening our minds to um, more opportunities. So I really think of this more of like a group think session. So please go ahead and put some comments in the chat. I will be asking some questions throughout, but otherwise, um, if there's any silences, it's probably because I'm just waiting for answers. So please jump in and I hope that we can solution this together. So there's me, there's my pup, that's Ziva. And she's a cat foster mom, so loves kitten season. And my first question for you all is, how are you currently utilizing volunteers? So you can go ahead and throw that in the chat. I'm on the lookout. There is a little bit sometimes of a, a delay just for people typing in to get in here. So how are you currently utilizing volunteers? You just throw that in the uh, questions box. Um, in all of our departments, helping with adoptions, community support and events, animal socializing and many other aspects, uh, manning booths at fundraisers. Perfect. Uh, volunteers for everything, feeding our community cats, caring for our adoptable cats, foster mom and dads, also helping us get our new building ready for the Cat Cafe in Panama City, Florida. Um, all volunteer, the, uh, many of the, these groups are all volunteer organizations. Perfect. Oh, I think that's it. Great. Um, well, great answers, and it really, you know, some of the areas we've identified are dog walking, cat socializing, I know that was mentioned, laundry, bottle baby feeding, grooming, and the common denominator for all of these is that they are basically physical, physical or facility-centric volunteer opportunities. So what I want to look at today is how do we expand that, and how do we expand reach, especially if you're a volunteer-only organization, and capacity can be a little bit limited, and I think personally you can never have enough volunteers. So I don't know about you all, and feel free to throw in the chat if you've been feeling this, but what I'm hearing from some of our partners across the nation are that volunteerism feels like it's dropped or people are really hurting for bodies, both with paid staffing and with volunteers. If you're feeling that way, please go ahead and add your sentiments to the chat. But I just wanna let you know that you're not crazy if you're feeling that way, because statistically that's exactly what we've been seeing. So according to a Gallup poll, 
volunteerism in 2021 was down 4% from where it was 20 years ago, which is kind of insane considering all the marketing and promotion that's been done over the past few years, just getting the word out via social media about volunteer opportunities in general. Uh, for reference, the peak of volunteerism was 65% of people polled in 2013. And you might think, well, we just had a pandemic. Of course, it's going to be low. People couldn't leave their houses, but we're actually down 3% from 2020. So let's see a little bit further why it might be low in 2021. So this is a breakdown. It's showing both charitable contributions and volunteerism. Um, of course, donations went up, which I know we heard a lot about anecdotally in the industry. And that could be for a number of reasons. People are home, they're spending less, they have some more expendable income, but uh, volunteerism is down and it's trending downwards um, ever since 2017. So I'm not sure exactly the reasons for this and we can totally talk about that towards the end of this presentation but it's just something to know that if you're feeling like you're overwhelmed there is probably a very good reason because volunteerism is going down and then a further look at um, the gallup poll for 2022 showing that volunteerism breakdown by income so i think in general we probably know that people who are able to volunteer are those who have the privilege of time and um, funds so that they can come and spend some of their free time. They're not typically working three jobs. They have um, a, the time to come into your facilities or they have the ability to have a car to be able to come to community events. Those who are making less than 40,000 are not able to volunteer as much, but I don't think that there's a, a lack of sentiment or desire to volunteer. So I wanna talk about how can we capture all the people in these um, income breakdowns. So my next question for you all, knowing that volunteerism has gone down um, or been stagnant for several years, what barriers do you think are keeping people from volunteering? You can throw that in the chat. I'm looking, looking <laughs> wait for people to- It's a, it's a uh, big question. Feel free to take some time, think about it. One one comment that came up sort of as you were presenting is a person saying that there's a problem when volunteers are always the same people mm. um, might end up feeling burned out, um, lack of time or money, yep. fear of COVID. Mm. It says here, COVID groups of people in close proximity, cats are not moving as quickly as pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Financial, people have lost, chain jobs, inflation is high. They have either had to cut costs, not driving places, spending gas, not being able to support more cats in their house as fosters, etc. No time when working to pay the bills. And that's about it. Perfect. Yeah, those all are super on point and areas that we've identified as well. We've broken down the lack of engagement and opportunity and so on for volunteerism as a reason for decline. So lack of engagement could be exactly, you know, you don't have the time and the money to reach out to individuals. When you're working, especially if you're a volunteer run organization and you're putting out fires left and right, how do you have the time to engage or identify more opportunities? And so I'm going to go through each. So lack of engagement, we're really thinking there's just, I think the first comment was, the same people who are volunteering and it can lead to burnout. That's exactly why it would help to continue to engage and engage new diverse groups of individuals. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are probably people in your communities who are already doing the work that we've all been doing in the sheltering and rescue space for a long time. They might not call it the same thing. They might not call it, you know, a pet resource center, but they're the people who provide food to their neighbors. They might not call it TNR, but they're the people who are helping get cats and get them the medical that they might need. And so while the language might be different, these are proximate leaders doing the same work in their communities. It's great to engage with them because not only will you then have more volunteers as an extension of your organization, but you're going to have um, these proximate leaders who've already built the trust in their communities. So instead of setting that time, you know, it can take years to build trust within a community. You have someone who's already part of that community doing in-reach instead of you focusing all the efforts on outreach. So I would love to talk about that community-centered style model and those community style um, engagement will also lead us away from those very facility focused volunteer programs that I referenced earlier. It's also great to engage with universities. So right now I'm in Austin, Texas for a conference and we were having this conversation and people said, you know, 
I reach out to UT all the time, I reach out to their vet school and I can't get any students who wanna volunteer. To which the comments back were, well, have you reached out to Houston Tillerson, which is the oldest institution here and it's an HBCU. And the comment was no, to which, you know, of course we're wondering why, why, right? I know when you think of Austin, UT is probably top of mind, but we should look at all the institutions. And on top of that, why are we limiting people by only looking at veterinary schools? And I think of myself when I think about that because there's so much intersectionality between the people and the pet space. So for myself, I think like many people on this call probably, I grew up, I loved animals, so of course I was going to be a veterinarian. And that's not the case. I worked in a veterinary clinic in college when I was pre-bio and very soon learned that it was not for me. And so I said, well, I'll go the policy route. And I decided to do political science and um, that was a way for me to get to where I am today and still have that love for animals. But had I not thought that there was some opportunity outside the vet space, which we all know that there is because we're in this industry, I would not have been able to engage future people like myself. So that's just a little bit about engagement. Lack of opportunity, you know, this is an area where we can really use that inclusive lens and figure out where we can use volunteers, especially when people are staying home because of the pandemic and fear of COVID or they don't have the resources they once had to be able to give them the freedom to volunteer. So for the opportunity, I really think about my grandmother. She is a very strict Muslim and she is someone who interprets the writings of the Quran. And of course, this is very cultural with her interpretation. And this is again, why cultural competency is so important. But for her, she believes that she cannot be in the same house or facility as a dog, because if the dog is there, the angels will not come and get her when her time comes, right? And so for me, I love my dog, I have my dog, I don't, I don't necessarily understand this, but it's not my place to understand it. What it is my place for is to respect it and identify opportunities for her that will still align with her beliefs. So what we've done, and I, she knows that I love animals and she loves animals too, she just, thinks that she can't be in or believes she can't be in the same space. So I tell her, you know, grandma, these dogs, I need some bandanas. Can you sew some bandanas for them for this community event? And she will get to work, right? And she loves it and she feel, feel, feels fulfilled. But I think a lot of people would immediately dismiss her and be like, oh, you can't be around dogs, like you can't volunteer, right? And I'll tell her, you know, these dogs are cold, they need blankets. So she'll gladly sew some blankets and she feels like she's really a part of the community. So for that, if I hadn't provide, provided that opportunity, we would have lost, you know, someone who was a, you know, master seamstress. So I think for, like, like looking outside that lens for opportunity is super helpful. There's also a lot of um, age restrictions when we're looking at volunteer programs. And I understand age restrictions make a lot of sense when it comes to liability and insurance and safety, but there's no reason why we are limiting people from volunteering under the age of 15 or 18 if they're not handling animals. And I think about my nieces, they are so savvy with their phones and taking pictures. And I know there was a session today about you know, photography. Why can't we use individuals like that to help with photographs uh, virtually? They could do editing for us, no problem. And then there's no liability there at all. So just looking at different opportunities for people and looking outside the way we've traditionally looked at applications and requirements for volunteers. And then I know we, you all mentioned the lack of ability for agency to train and manage. People are short staffed, people are lacking in funds. If we can, again, engage with those community centered proximate leaders, that would free up a lot of our time on site and give us time to put out those fires and do everything that we might need because other people are doing the work. But on top of that, I'd like to look at ways that we can automate trainings and applications and streamline processes as much as possible. So I'll talk a little bit that, about that in a bit. Lastly, lack of accessibility. I know people mentioned, you know, might not be able to have a car to drive in. There are different ways of being accessible for individuals that virtual volunteerism will solve for. So you might not have a place that is geographically accessible. It might be the only facility in a town, but people can't drive an hour to get there or come to that community event because they might not have a vehicle, or are events and spaces wheelchair accessible? Something to think about. And so if that if they're not, why can't we find other virtual opportunities for people to volunteer? And of course, there's also, like I said earlier, people might be working multiple jobs, so their hours might not align. So can we find something that's more accessible for individuals throughout the night? I know when I was in college, I was up all night, and so I decided to foster kittens because if I'm studying, why not have a little bit of kittens that I could bottle feed at the same time? And thank goodness, 
I was working with an organization who gave me that chance, but I think, think typically people would dismiss a college student. Did anyone have any questions about these general lack of um, engagement opportunity and ability and accessibility? Don't see any questions at this point in time. Cool. Thank you, Stacey. So now I want to kind of take the opportunity to look at volunteerism through the gap through the lens of a volunteer and then identify gaps in programs that we might be able to solve for. So if you're looking at it, you know, like I mentioned, as my grandmother or as my nieces or as someone who might not be able to come on site, what are some ways that they might be able to volunteer? So I've broken that down into four places. You can start with basic. And I think with basic, the way I think of it is that as opportunities that people don't need to have industry knowledge for. It could just be that they need volunteer hours or credits, or it could just be that they want to do something good and they reach out to your, your facility and they might not be able to come in. But these are super basic, super easy. Like I mentioned, there's the photo editing. That's something that people under age can do easily once they get their hands on an iPhone, right? Or any kind of phone. There's cross-posting on social media. I am a millennial, but Gen Z is blowing me out of the water with their social media skills. And it's like so simple for them to go post and spread some words. So instead of hiring someone or doing it yourself, this could be something where you can ha have people speak out on your behalf. And of course, canned online projects. I've been speaking with a lot of people about their volunteer application process. And there are a lot of, you know, back and forth before someone's able to even come on site or do a volunteer project. How about when they submit an application, you send an auto response right back to them saying, hi, thank you for your interest in volunteering. In the meantime, here are some projects you can do. And it can be a video of making cat toys or caranda beds or anything else that you might need or, you know, cutting up newspaper for a project. These canned online projects are something that people can do immediately if there are no restrictions. And a lot of time we know people will reach out, they're motivated in the moment, and then you never hear from them again. So this is a way to capture them in that moment, build that momentum, and then get them engaged from the start with these super simple projects. And then we can move into intermediate, which is someone who might have a little bit more knowledge about the industry. And for this, I really think of people like myself who I really love true crime. And I love, you know, acting like a detective and figuring out all these solutions and everything. So if we put that energy of all these true crime lovers out there into cross posting of lost and found animals and dead end microchip research, I feel like the limit does not exist with what we can accomplish. And I think that this is a great way if, if you're able to trust people with some sensitive information around microchips, this is something that can help keep some animals in their homes for sure. So I love the intermediate. That is another area I would have loved to volunteer when I was younger. Then we get into more advanced. So there could be professionals who are out there doing a ton of research, writing grants or writing in general or doing administrative tasks. And they're probably really great at it, but they don't feel fulfilled. So what's more fulfilling than being able to do that for an organization where you're helping animals? This is a way to channel what they're great with and they want to do the time with. And they might not be able to come on site, but this is something they can do from home after hours or on their lunch breaks and really meet them where they're at. Same thing goes for digitizing documents. I think there's a lot of people who, like if you were to ask me to do this for some company I didn't care about, I would really probably dread my day to day. But if I'm able to do it for animals and a place to help out, I would do it with such enthusiasm. So again, it's building on that momentum and inspiring people in a different way. And internships, this is again, you know, I had mentioned that I went from being pre-veterinary to pre-law and I started interning in the office for a city council member. And so that legislation that Stacy mentioned, a lot of it started when I was an intern and the council member was just like, yeah, if you want to do the research because you have the time, go for it. So I did the research and we were able to pass some really groundbreaking legislation. And that was all because he gave me the opportunity to be an intern for him. He wouldn't have been able to do this on his own because he had other high priority items that his constituents wanted. But because I had already laid down the groundwork, he had the capacity to pass such legislation. And the same thing goes for things like marketing, branding, logistics, IT, tons of IT professionals out there that we could be utilizing for software and data management. Lastly, for advanced, engage with lo local businesses. I have a former colleague who he reached out to a hardware store that traditionally did bird housing classes on the weekends. Like, hey, learn, come and learn how to build a birdhouse. And it was a great marketing campaign for the hardware store. But he went to them and he asked them, hey, can we do a doghouse building one day? 
And so they did, and the hardware store came back and said it was the the highest attended event that they've had because people felt this immediate connection with the cause and they knew that these houses were going to their local shelter. So they were able to engage and it was something that was continued to be fruitful for the community. And then we have miscellaneous um, items like you have some larger canned projects. So I don't know about you all, but when I was working in a facility in LA, you know, big companies would reach out like Google and Facebook and stuff. And they're like, hey, we're gonna have a hundred volunteers come in. And I'm like, that's great, but I don't have a project for a hundred volunteers. And I also think that's gonna scare my animals, right? So how do you engage these volunteers and make sure that you can still, obviously you wanna capture this good deed that people wanna do and you wanna be easy to work with because then people just leave thinking, gosh, it's so hard to do a good deed, right? And that's not the sentiment that we would want. So um, instead, let's get them some canned projects that they can do on site. So again, it could be things like the basic online projects, the larger canned ones, like building a crane of ed, building dog houses, but as a team. And then we can also use these volunteers for transport. They could do the mapping and logistics that we might not have to do, time to do for general transports. And that's a lot of information. It's just a sampling of what we could do when we're looking at remote and virtual opportunities. But anyone have any questions or comments? I'm taking a look here. Um, so uh, there's one comment. Uh, we also need to push our local, state, and federal officials to realis realize that this problem is too large for it to be solved by a bunch of volunteers. We need the issue to be included in public funding, government budgets. Community cats need community funding, not a few people constantly begging for a few bags of cat chow every now and again. Absolutely, and I think that's a way to get some volunteers engaged, right? You might not have the capacity to hire a lobbyist or someone on your team who could be a liaison with your government officials, but use people who are, or people who are working within those offices to be your volunteers and be your voice. Because you're right, this is a policy issue as well. Um, that's about it for the comments at this point. All right. Well, then I want to look at specifically how to break bias for increased inclusivity in our sheltering projects and, and, and facilities. So, like I mentioned, you'll want to identify proximate leaders in your communities. These are people who are already out there doing the work, they have trust within their communities, they have the relationships that are built. So instead of trying to force, you know, what is it, a round peg in a square hole? No, the other way, square peg, round hole. And instead of trying to force something that might not be the easiest to come through, why not reach those people who are already doing that work? So identifying and collaborating with community leaders is a great place to start. And that leads into community inreach because you're going to promote these individuals. Instead of doing community outreach and reaching out to them to try to get their word, you're doing inreach and working from within authentically. And when you present authentically, I think things just move so much faster and more powerfully. And of course, I think something that's a key when working with these communities is asking them what they need instead of assuming or telling them what they need. I've heard from some um, partners who have said, you know, they, they were trying to get some donations and they said, what we really need is a computer so we can do some data collection to help us apply for grants. And the donor came back and was like, no, 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 what you need is some um, some dog beds. And they were like, no, we don't need dog beds. We have plenty. We, we had a dog bed making project. And so they ended up with a bunch of dog beds, which is great, but it wasn't what they necessarily needed to get them to their future goals. So it's really important to listen and respect when someone is letting you know what they need in their community. So it could be what they need for their community cats that they might know better than I would going in as an outsider. And then self-assessment is major. I think you all being here today is a big step in looking at how do we look at our programs through a more diverse lens. Here at CARE, we've developed a training called READY. It stands for Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And it's a certification where our really our big goal is to get people to go back to their organizations and look at what um, their current applications, policies, and procedures are, and where they can identify gaps to create more inclusive programs. So one organization who did this, Humane Indiana, came back and let us know that they took the training, and once they did that, they said, let's start with our programs. And the first program they looked at was their foster program. 
and they looked at the application and got rid of some of these unnecessary requirements. So it could be things like I had mentioned earlier with looking at age restrictions or geographic restrictions. They looked at their application and within that short span of time from when they took the training, I think it was six months, to when they were like done implementing, they had increased their foster program by 600 people and families. So for that, what was interesting by comparison was they also got a big grant for marketing and that did not yield a growth in their foster program. So it really shows what can happen when we step back and look at the way we've been doing things. And of course, we hear it all the time, people saying, well, this is how we've always done it, or you know, this just, I don't have the time to look at it. And I also think sometimes people like myself, I've had to do a lot of unlearning and things that I thought were the right way to do things might not be. And there's no shame in that because otherwise you're not learning and growing as a human. So I think, you know, embrace the change. And that leads me into the next element is positive disruption. And it's complicated because I think historically we all think of disruption as maybe a negative thing, like, oh, that person's a disruptor. I think of kids like interrupting in class or something like that. And it's not. Disruption is merely the catalyst for change. And the way I think of it is like you're looking at this lake that's still and when you come and you skip a rock, it causes this beautiful change and ripple effect that can you know, who knows what's going on under the water, but that change is going to yield some growth. So we're trying to push some positive destruction and I'm, or disruption, and I'm excited to share that. At CARE, we're starting a circle, it's called the Changemaker Circle. And in this circle, we're really looking for partners like you all, where you can be a part of the change, and it's whatever your comfort level is, but one of them is disruptor. And I'm hoping to change that negative connotation to show that disruption is a positive way to yield change and break bias, and we're only going to have a great production of more lives saved. So that is what I'm hoping to do with positive disruption. Any questions on any of these four areas for breaking bias? I am on the lookout here. All right. I think this could be an incredible checklist system based on these slides. That's one thing that I notice is there's just a lot of different different checklists in here. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is just, you know, slowing down for just a moment and looking at looking inward, looking into your organization and how you've been doing things um, and, and identifying ways to use your community around you, whether it is in the immediate proximity or those who you know. So don't think of your community just as like the 70,000 people in your town or even the 70,000 adults in your town. Think about like we, you could have people in Austria doing photo editing for you if you're just spreading the word because your stories will resonate from people across the world. Uh, nope, I think we're good, no questions. All right. Well, that is really the extent of my content because I was hoping that we could look at some people's individual programs and go through it maybe from start to end and identify solutions together. I don't know if anyone wanted to share their program in the chat and we can talk about it, but some people who I've done this with have shared that, you know, their volunteer processes, they submit an application and then um, they get it back, they assess the application maybe a week later because they're super busy, and then they do an interview, and then they do another um, application, and then they do another interview, and then it has an in-person training, and they do this for every single volunteer, even if they're not handling animals. So we were able to go back and be like, okay, well, why is this, this first application asking this, this, this? You know, why can't you send an automated response with some canned projects they can do right then and there? or something for people under 15 and go from there. So if anyone wants to share anything, and please don't be shy. I am happy to share my challenges around volunteering with being a virtual organization. So I'm on the board of, um, I'm the board president for Positive Pantry, which is uh, provides pet food for um, pet sh uh, food shelves in Massachusetts and Vermont, and then the United Spay Alliance, we have volunteers doing online research. And we've used a lot of the resources like uh, Volunteer Match, um, some of those, you know, placement sort of services. And I would say our success rate from those um, services are, are not that great. Um, and you know, we try to be as clear as possible. Like this is this is our research, it's data entry. We're very clear about what we're looking for. So 
I'm not sure if like half the time it's like students that have to be looking for a volunteer opportunity and they have to like submit like 10 or 20 different uh, requests or something, but I just find that there's a lot of wasted time in that and finding volunteers to do work virtually and then managing them on a regular basis for retention purposes are hugely challenging. So I don't know if you have any magical tips in that arena. Yeah, I mean, I have a few initial thoughts. So I know it's kind of like, um, I know there was a study done recently with people saying, we've, we've tried to hire more in, uh, diverse individuals, but we're not getting responses. And the answer to that typically is, well, where are you where are you posting it? Are people from you know marginalized communities going on to volunteer match and finding opportunities there? They might not have access to internet or computers and things like that. So you want to somehow find a way to be more equitable as far as the accessibility to just knowing about that. So that's where that engagement piece is key and the proximate leaders for sure. Um, but I think to your point about managing it, the hope is that eventually you can have a volunteer who's doing that on your behalf or automate it so the data is coming in, but still having a way for people to feel fulfilled and like they're part of the community. So if someone's working from home and they're doing data collection and they're not able to come on site, like there might be volunteers you could never possibly meet. But setting up like a, a quick virtual check-in or any kind of thank you email has been has shown to be just as effective. I like to use something called Sugar Wish a lot where I send them a box and they can just choose the candies. And it's just somewhere for them to be like, hey, I can't be on site. And I don't get to do that cute cuddling and stuff that I think volunteering with animals is, but I still get to know that I'm making a difference and I'm appreciated. So I think that just that small appreciation component is great for morale and retention. Excellent, excellent. Um, this person hasn't tried it yet, but would like the nonprofit, their nonprofit to align itself with the local boy, uh, Boys and Girl Scout troops. Uh, where they are already in the mindset of volunteering for the community. So what sort of community groups should we focus our connections? You know, I think the easiest thing there is one might think, well, I need to hire a volunteer coordinator to manage this. You can turn that troop leader into a volunteer themselves, right? They're already volunteering. It doesn't take a lot of time. They're merely going to act as a liaison between yourself and that organization or that troop. So people are looking for it. They might think that, oh, this is a formal process, I have to go through it. And really that formality and that limitation has been created from us historically. If we remove that, we're like, hey, please be an extension. And then a lot of times you'll find too, there are people who might simply need community service hours or credits, and you can find them to be liaisons for these programs. And they might not necessarily be as big of animal lovers as we are, but they're big into volunteerism where they want for the community service hours. So use them as that liaison as well. Can you talk a little bit about how to identify and connect with proximate leaders in our communities while ensuring we are avoiding tokenizing them or causing harm? Great point. So I do appreciate that there's awareness around tokenizing and causing harm. I think it all has to come from the approach, right? So you there's a a fine line between asking people to share their trauma in order to like prove that they need funding or assistance right and on the other hand it's like i was saying of instead of proving your trauma and asking them or telling them what they need because of this trauma ask them for what they need and you're probably thinking well how do i connect with them the lowest hanging fruit answer is making sure you have representation representation within your own community so that's, there's a story that i've just learned that i think is pretty interesting that i'll share is um, LL Cool J in like the really big height of his career was asked to do an ad for Gap. And he was like, yeah, I'll do this ad. And so Gap was really excited and they spent a ton of money on this ad. But when he got there, he said, I need to wear this hat because um, my head's a weird shape. I'm insecure about the shape of my head. And they're like, okay, whatever. Like he's the hottest rapper right now. You can wear your hat. So they do the ad. It's great. It gets tons of publicity. And um, months later, they find out that the hat he was wearing was FUBU, which is a black owned brand. So he basically did an ad for FUBU for Gap that Gap paid for. And it wasn't until months later that the Gap team realized this. And that was because there wasn't enough representation on their team to know that they were doing something for a black owned brand. So the founder of um, of uh, FUBU, he shares that story because it's, again, it's representation matters. So if you can look at having more representation within your own teams, they will have some knowledge about proximate leaders that you might not have and I might not have. So I think that's the bit easiest way to start. Of course, if you're volunteer run only, that's where I would say something like going back to contacting your local universities and HBCUs that aren't always top of mind. 
So, you know, contact local churches and things like that, where people are already going to be volunteers and people will know the leaders in their own communities because they're doing the work. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in a way, though, I mean, I'll just share the thought that after you told that story that just went through my mind is, do I really, should I care that he mm -hmm. advertised, you know, a, a black owned business? I mean, you know, it's people stick Coke and Pepsi and things in places and, and you know, unintentional items like that, you know, happen, I guess. I don't know. I, I, from, from the, the gap side of things, I, I don't know. I just would just sort of say, you know, it's that is identified with him, the person, right? Because he probably wears, that's probably like something he wears all the time. So it's part of his brand almost. I mean, even though it might have resulted in the sales of hats, it's part of his essence, right? So, and his character. So I don't know if I would really, should or would care too much about it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would feel fine with promoting a, a black owned brand for sure, you know, or a BIPOC owned brand. But I think it comes down to like the money and the energy that they were hoping to use for their own brand, you know. But yes, absolutely. Also, hey, it's benefiting still for good. Right. I mean, like, uh, you know, at the US Open, um, uh, Oh, uh, Naomi Osaka, you know, was wearing her a lot of different face masks and people wear different swag when they go out on the professional sporting world. Some of it is paid sponsorship. Some of it is voluntarily they're wearing their stuff to, to get the word out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I think that there's maybe that balancing act of, you know, what I want to do as an individual versus what I want to be painted like by my sponsors. Mm. Yeah. It's a fair point. Yeah, so. Um, all right, let me see if there are any other questions in here. Um, can you talk a little bit or share a little bit about your thoughts around um, onboarding volunteers and also volunteerism at the board level? Um, yeah. You know, what's the, what's the process um, or what, you know, what could be the process so that, that we aren't putting unintentional obstacles up? Yeah, I think for me, I if I were to have an ideal volunteer program, it's to be as easy to do work with as possible. The same way when we're doing adoptions, we're putting up sometimes unnecessary barriers that can lead animals out of their home. So for a, an onboarding program, I would say someone hears about your organization, they come on your website or they call for a volunteer opportunity immediately an email like i said should get sent back where they're told thank you for reaching out we'll be in touch soon in the meantime here are some immediate ways you can help our organization and you can hold up a picture of a cute little chihuahua and be like he needs a sweater here's how you can cut socks you know or like a kitten and they need bottle feeding learn how to bottle feed here or we need you to spread the word in your community about community cats and what they need, right? So sending something back, because when people reach out, they're in some immediate moment of like, I'm going to do something good. And you want to capture that before it quickly switches to, gosh, it's so hard to do something good, right? And people, especially, I think generationally, we're seeing that millennials and Gen Z are impulsive. And if you're difficult to do work with, and if you don't provide a why, people are quick to move on to something that will. And they also want that immediate sense of fulfillment. And that comes with this immediate gratification. Like the second you want something, you can buy it on Amazon and have it to your house within the next day, right? So people are used to having everything fed to them. They're not used to reaching out for what they are trying to get done. So for an onboarding process, I would say, get that application or grasp them right when they do that immediate um, interest form or whatever it might be. Get in touch with them. Try and if you don't have to do interviews or um, physical trainings, I would scrap that. I understand for dog walking or community cat trapping and things like that, you'll want to be there physically, but I think it has to be tiered. So if you're going to engage them on a virtual level, here are some opportunities. We need some help with lost and found. We need some help with microchips and you can engage them for that and then waive those other interview and requirements that you might have. So for onboarding, have it tiered, which does take work, right? Building this out, but putting that initial work in is going to pay off in the future quite well because you won't have to be managing all these trainings and everything. If people are coming in and they're just going to go home and make some newspaper beds, there's no reason for them to come and do a training with you and take a few hours of your day, right? So there's that. And then for board engagement, again, I say, 
reach out to your community and engage them and identify these proximate leaders. And I didn't totally um, touch on the tokenizing, but I, I wanted to say it's all about how you approach that task. And it's like, it kind of reminds me of Ruth Bader Ginsburg when they asked her, how many women on the Supreme Court is enough? She's like, when there are nine, right? So you're not going to have your one person and use it as a check mark and say, okay, I met my BIPOC quota. Because also, for those of you who don't know, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. I am a person of color, but it doesn't mean if you have me on your birth that I'm going to be able to speak for the lived experiences of Black and Indigenous individuals. So it doesn't mean you stop at me, right? Keep it going. I'll identify proximate leaders, and together as a board, you'll be able to identify people and not tokenize them in that way. Yeah. I think that um, we all have concerns about spending a lot of time on our volunteers and and you know not having it be successful doing a lot of batch work so the volunteer orientation once a month s solves that sort of um onboarding orientation and also the statement of like oh well i volunteered for this group but i didn't know they had this program and i didn't know i had that program and so you say oh well but you did the orientation therefore you did see everything and so i think that's sort of the the thought process around having the PowerPoint slide where people get walked through this, you know, the first Saturday of every month or whatever. Um, but I, I also understand where you're talking about the millennials or, you know, younger folks not having a lot of patience. And there was also a study where it said a lot of the millennials, um, they are the lowest percentage group to adopt from a shelter um, because they are going to go where they can instantaneously get and, and I mean, if you're a college student, most, I will say most rescues do not adopt out to college students. Um, luckily, my daughter was at a school where they had a progressive mindset and most of the, a lot of students had pets and, and the local shelters were comfortable with that. But I think that that's rare and unique in many cases. Um, and I, it might be changing a little bit with the, the EAS, uh, you know, animal type thoughts with kids in college and stuff, but um, it's definitely been a challenge in the past. Therefore, if they have this mentality in that 18 to 22 window or even younger, then um, it's gonna be challenging later on for them to say, oh, now I'm gonna go to the shelter and I'm gonna go and fill out my, you know, have my landlord be checked and do my three personal references and all that kind of stuff. So definitely see a lot of obstacles there for sure. Um, I, but on the yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say I think something too is when we have like I have immediate responses in my head when someone says something, and you know I have friends who've chosen to buy dogs, which I was like, well, did you contact me? I could have helped and all these things, but not everyone has a resource who's been in the industry and things like that. But it, I always try to before I say that initial response that I've been trained to say for 20 years, like when someone who is an international student who's training in the U.S. for two years wants to get a cat. And the initial response is like, well, what happens after those two years? Where does that cat go? Instead of immediately saying, no, thank you. We don't adopt out to people who are international students and are leaving. The next response that I would stop myself to then say is, okay, how can we utilize this individual? They're obviously interested. They want to adopt. They're aware of adoption or whatever program it is that you might be doing. So how do you get them to be a volunteer? And it's that you just want to make sure people never have that negative experience with trying to do a good deed. And I think that's where millennials are often changing because they're like, oh, this is way too hard. I'm just going to go pay $5,000 because someone told me I wasn't good enough, right? Or something like that. So removing that personal element and still capturing that person as some type of opportunity, that international student will help raise awareness in languages that I would never even dream of being able to get the word out in, right? So if you can capture them as a as a contact and then they can then spread the word with international students, you have maybe 50 volunteers right there. So I think we just have to take a step back think about it and see like, okay, how can I use this as an opportunity instead of a limitation? Should we think of our volunteers as potential donors? Always. So I know on that those Gallup polls that I showed, there's that correlation between donors and volunteers. But what's interesting is that, yes, the number of the percentage of people who were donating in that 100,000 plus group is higher. It is the people who are making 40,000 or less who are donating a greater percentage of their income, right? And yes, people, when they're engaged and when they have a positive association with your organization, they're going to be more inclined to donate. It doesn't matter 
in what space they are. And like we all know, you can have one donor who gives you $1,000 or you can have 100 donors who are giving you $10, right? Like it's all about really spreading the love and not focusing in one channeled area. And I think I've had these blinders on and when I said I'm doing some unlearning, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the world is my oyster and I have made it so small through just years of training and the way I've had my thought process. And it's okay to expand, but it is hard the main thing I can say to you all is, yes, volunteers, the same way we're hesitant to like expand our volunteer programs is the same way we're nervous to expand when it comes to inclusion because you're worried about making a mistake, right? So just don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And if you think about it, like imagine if we had that same thought in those nerves when we were learning to walk. So there's those three stages of learning, right? There's the awkward phase where you're falling and you're like tripping over yourself. Then there's the mechanical phase where you're like, okay, one step onto the other, I got this, and now it's automatic. I don't think about it at all, right? Same thing will happen when you're developing these programs. So just don't be nervous and just start wherever and reach out to myself and Stacey, any resources to get started. Uh, another comment here to sort of in, talking about sort of the automatic auto reply. Um, this person's actually thinking that that might be a turnoff. Um, she'd rather wait a day or two and send out a personal response because if a person doesn't have that kind of patience how long are they going to stick with the task at hand i think that's a good point some people might want to wait two days i think people will feel in general people feel better when they know their email is not going into some vague abyss when you're laying out the expectations for them and saying hi thank you so much we are back here feeding 100 kittens, but we'll be back to you soon. In the meantime, if you're so in interested, please, you can do these tasks. So it's just that gap filler. It doesn't have to be an alternative or a supplement for one or the other. It more complements your program. Gotcha. Excellent. Very good. Well, I think we are good. I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to break a little bit early and have a little bit of a break because for those on the West Coast, it's almost like lunchtime getting there. So. Um, and you are in Central right now, so it is lunchtime. <laughs> um, but if folks have any other questions, uh, get them in now, but it looks like we've got all the questions covered. But this was fantastic, very thought-provoking. Thought I think it's so funny because there's like the diversity structure around volunteering, but then there's the challenges of volunteering itself and volunteer management, and how do they interrelate with one another? Because I think just volunteering alone is and staff management are very challenging things in animal welfare. Agreed, yeah, the, it, and it just goes to show there's intersectionality everywhere and we just have to continue to think about things as these really holistic uh, realms. But thank you so much for having me and if you all wanna email me, my email is just Sheila at careawo.org and I love to talk through these programs and continue to expand our minds together.